Hey guys, Dan here at Merlin, and uh, it's Freaks and Geeks Friday. It is. So, uh, just a few left, and this one is called uh, Dead Dogs and Gym Teachers. Which doesn't roll off the tongue very and well. We, no, I think it's the most cumbersome of all their titles. I didn't believe the title. I'm but we were it. discussing off air. It is accurate. <laughs> it is. It, it does describe the, episode, the two things that happen. Plot points, um, pretty much. And maybe they couldn't think of a rhyme. Usually they do a, a rhyming. Not always, but you know the diary wasn't. But most of them are rhyming. You could do dogs and dogs and uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I was something with coaches, coaches coach. and snooches. <laughs> yeah, know. see, it's tough. It's not, they, that's why they gave it. up. They you gave can't up. do it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so a lot of background on this one uh, because this is, of course, as we talked about last week, the first episode after the cancellation. Yes, and NBC did not let's air the the rest of the things. They said nope. We're canceling you. That was your last episode this yeah. week. Goodbye. So they never aired this one. Um, in the summer when they brought back three episodes, it was the final three. So they have two that they didn't air that aired later in the year on Fox Family when they got the rights to all the reruns. So this one was actually written uh, with very little input from Paul Feig, hmm. who, you know, obviously he's on most of these commentaries I, I listen to. He's very involved, but... Uh, because Apatow saw the writing on the wall, okay, um, he sort of told Feig, look, you need to write a finale that can serve as a season or series finale, and go ahead and do that. We'll worry about this episode. Hmm. So this was the episode that they filmed after they filmed the finale. Oh. So they filmed a bunch of the ones we've already seen, then the finale... And then the next four or five episodes. Because I guess Judd figured even if they cancel us, they're not going to just yank us off the air after 14 episodes. They'll give us you know, an episode or two, and <laughs> that, that never happened. So um, uh, wait. So they were filming this while Paul Feig... So does that mean that... Or they were writing this rather while Paul Feig was writing the finale. Feig would have been working on a finale without input of what might have been happening in other episodes that could have preceded it? My guess is they gave him an outline okay. of sorts okay. uh, with the ideas... But, yeah, I mean, basically, huh. uh, he wrote... Well, at this point in time, most of these episodes really kind of become standalone mm. because of that. Okay. Um, I mean, there's still sort of an inkling of a thread, but it's stuff... Like, think about this episode. There's nothing in this episode that hadn't already been happening for weeks. Like, Nick was lamenting Lindsay, still but that's on. been going on for a month. So it's, it's a continuation. You know, there's really any development. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, this has no ties to, like, okay, this actually happened to Paul Feig, like a lot of these episodes do. Hmm. However, Apatow, who uh, co-wrote this episode, um, really was drawing on his own stuff for Bill, hmm. which we'll get to. He, his mom didn't date, you know, a, a coach or, or a teacher, but um, his parents were divorced when he was Bill's age, and so the first time they were sort of dating other people and... One of them comes into the, the kitchen in the morning and gets coffee in their underwear. It's like, oh, God. like mm. you know. So that was sort of drawn yeah. from Apatow. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Busy Phillips, though, our good friend. Tell me about it. Because she was on this commentary. Oh. So I finally got the the entire scoop of why she's not a series regular. Okay. We've, been, we've gotten a couple of different threads of the story um, that we've told here on this. But uh, so essentially... She, her agent this was the first job she ever had mm -hmm. and her agent said well go ahead and don't do that because we are in line to get you a series regular role on this other show so we're gonna we're gonna wait for that okay so her somebody not her mother but like some confidant of hers some mentor of hers maybe an acting teacher or something said listen why don't you go in for this Freaks and Geeks pilot and, you know, in case this other show doesn't work out, which it didn't, of course. <laughs> um, and so, you know, whatever. But they couldn't, even though they love the Kim Kelly character, uh -huh. the reason they couldn't make her an official series regular until season two is because she was still under this contract uh -huh. for the show that never existed. I think it was for ABC. Wow. Um, and... So she thank God for it. She couldn't commit, but basically. She, so she literally was unable legally to commit to this series, but said basically, Here. You, you can have me as a guest star in every episode, 
Um, That's cool. Which was not unheard of because back in, I remember the early 90s, Melrose Place mm-hmm. did it with Heather Locklear, and it was like in the theme song every single episode, and special guest star Heather Locklear. Huh. Well, she was the hottest one on the show. She was the most popular character. She was in every single episode. But technically not a main cast but member. technically, I guess, not a main cast member. That's weird. And I never knew until thinking about the Freaks and Geek stuff, it probably was some sort of contractual thing. Mm, like, I can't commit because I don't know what's going on with this other yes, show. Yes, either, right, either she's got something else going yeah. on or da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, very odd. Interesting. Um, but they also talked a little bit about Busy's Dawson's Creek run oh. on the commentary and what was different from the Freaks and Geeks. So, Dawson's Creek, she was on for, I think, a season and a half or two seasons or something. Like, 40 episodes she did. And she said that they were so specific with their scripts. It was all about the written word, no improv, you can't even do anything. And the example she gave was, in one scene, she could say something like, oh, yes, the apple right there. And they would have to halt the scene and say, no, no, the line is an apple, not the apple. She said that's how specific it was. Wow. So okay, and some people, really, some directors are like some that. directors are like that, and some writers are like that. But to me, the proof is in the pudding, because this show, the dialogue on this show, which obviously some of it is scripted, sure, sure. But Apatow's famous for letting his, you know, actors kind of feel the characters out and riff riff a little bit. And we've learned that the the dad, Mr. Weir, uh, hardly did any he of, does a lot the of script. Him, uh, Right, well, he did whatever know, he wanted. No, I mean, I'm afraid, you know, I, it's going to de- it. deviate, but I have a okay. question because yeah. it relates, I guess, a lot to freaks and geeks. I mean, how do you feel about that in general, like with scripts being word for word with not a lot of wiggle room? Because I know that Tarantino uh, is the example that's famously yes. like that. Like, yep. no, you say this you thing, say the exact that way, this way, you know, and I guess they can. And he gets great results. He does. They act around it, but the dialogue's the same. Yeah. I, but I think a lot of a lot of directors are, allow their allow their actors to improv a bit around the lines if yes. it seems more natural. And overall, generally, I kind of think I'd prefer that. With if you have a great the more free form, yeah. If, as yeah, long as I it's in too. character with what the vision is. Well, and like what's interesting is you see it way more often with comedy movies. Oh yeah, and not just Apatow, but you know the Jump Street <laughs> movies and basically any R-rated comedy. Certainly, you get the Blu-ray and it's got the the twenty-minute gag reel of years. Yeah. Here's all the different outtakes. outtakes and the different line Those reads. are funny, though. Those are, I think, hilarious. Sometimes I think, oh, well, maybe they, kept they didn't even, yeah, they didn't even maybe pick the best line to me. <laughs> but, you know, obviously they tested it or whatever and went with it. But, and that's why we get a lot of the lines in, in trailers that aren't in the movies. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm not obviously going to say Judd Apatow started that, but we see a lot of TV today that is molded almost in that. Um, in the way that you think the actors are improvising because it's so naturally kind of freeform. Like The Office is a great example of that. Everybody that, that has worked on The Office said, no, no, like this is actually everything in the show is scripted. Now, it's probably not as specific to the word. Oh, but very but, close. But it, it seems very, it's got that kinetic sort of improv type energy that you could believe. That must, well, I guess with the you office, know, that's just a relaxed atmosphere. Relaxed atmosphere, but I think, you know, um, the same goes for, like, Modern Family, I think is is probably mostly all scripted, but mm-hmm. it has that sort of freeform I, I nature think to it. you've got to have some logo room. Yes, and and Tarantino is a great example that you brought up because we both love his movies. Yes. And I do think his, his words are Powerful. so important. That he, um, he's a writer, but I, he obviously allows his actors to play with those words and how yes. they perform them. Right, yes. Yeah. I guess that's true. And I guess when I think about, like, okay, the difference between a script by Tarantino <laughs> and a script by Joe Schmo that wrote episode 8 of Dawson's Creek, mm. there's maybe. obviously some sort of, you know, well, maybe difference he there. He's that good. But maybe he thinks he's that good and you must... Do exactly Maybe what I say. Could, could that also be a studio thing? Like the network's like, ah, oh, no, we, it has to like meet certain standpoints well, so that yeah, it doesn't offend anybody. It could. Maybe. Um, and we've we've said on this show that Apatow um, did more film on each episode than I think any other mm. show that NBC had ever had. Mm. But he was like, look, I don't know what I want to keep. And, I, you know, we've got to <laughs> film it all. We'll edit it um, later, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that to me was a very, when I heard Busy Phillips 
tell that story. Like that was a very stark contrast to me because this show is not completely improv, obviously, no. but and it's not you know like Curb. Curb is completely improv. They have a rough dialogue. They have a rough um, outline outline of the scene. Maybe they have a line they need to end on, but <laughs> other than that, it's all free form, which is great for that show. But not everybody. Can but pull not it off. not everybody you can know, pull it off, and not every show can pull I, it. Off. I will say that's pretty cool because um, with Curb, like I guess just with the, that group of, of comedians and that general sensibility, mm -hmm. it seems scripted to me. It really does. It really does. It really does, and that's what you know. Look, that's, they're, that's, they're professional improvisers obviously um and a lot of shows you know can't do that and what's interesting that judd let these people do is this is most of their first jobs mm. i mean this was uh you know bill's first job this was i think neil's first job busy phillips obviously it's her first job i think it might be siegel's first job too well he's not overbearing right? he's not overbearing um but you know i think i think he is okay with letting the actors find their characters sure and sort of modify scripts around that. Around that, which um, is as a show would be more established. Writers would have to do right. Whereas, like I've heard stories of Friends, like Friends will the, they would tape their show, um, you know, in front of the studio audience, and between takes or between scenes, uh, you know, they would just the writers would be punching up all these different other lines. But, oh, that line didn't get enough of a laugh, or this line needed to be said you know more like this for the audience to react this way um you know judd didn't have those constraints because he wasn't doing a studio audience hmm. so he was just like well whatever just whatever feels right for you do it um and so cool yeah so uh there you go that's a cool. little background on the 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 show that we didn't know i mean we knew they improv but that much? the fact that busy phillips then went to dawson's creek which was this very rigid um, by the numbers. By the numbers, you must say what is in this script. I've I've not really seen a lot of Dawson's Creek clips here or there. Reputation. But, um, yeah, I know the reputation, but now that I know that, like I I kind of want to watch hardcore. an episode just as. I mean, we're watching the OC for you know another review show that we've been doing on my channel. And one of the one of the eight on the other end of the spectrum, um, kind of. <laughs> and I think we can agree that dialogue is more. The classic teen soap. It's pretty standard. You know, yeah. uh, 902 World Melodramatic. Melodramatic, Dawson's Creek type of stuff. Uh, but you have to imagine they're probably not as rigid about the lines. I like, can't. I can't imagine Peter well, Gallagher well, saying, okay, I guess I'll do this exactly to the effing word that you say. Unless that is the... Of the exact contract, dialogue that is written it. that we see on the scripts every episode. Which I don't is, know. You know, let's... They're writing for the level uh, of their brain. Uh, like, you know? I always found when I was doing theater and stuff, now, unless I'm doing, like, some famous play or whatever, you know, Shakespeare or what mm -hmm. have you, but uh, I find it easier to sort of say something how I would say it or how I think the character would say it. And that sometimes includes turning a different phrase or, you know, phrasing something more as a question than a statement or something like that. And it sounds to me like... You know, people on the, the creep did not let that fly at all. That just sounds weird. Whereas here, you know, Apatow and Feig let people do whatever they wanted. So, not whatever they wanted, but, but you know what I mean. A little more freedom to experiment. Like the song we're going to talk about with uh, Siegel and um, Ken. Seth Rogen, yeah. Ken. Uh, Siegel just wrote that. Did he? They didn't write a song in the script. They said, go... Have have twenty minutes. You guys can come up with a song. Lady L. They apparently came up with a song together, him and him and him and Siegel or um, him Rogen. and him and Seth Rogen. And Siegel was like, you know, this isn't. It's it's cheesy. It's not, it's bad not enough. quite. Yeah, he's like, it's not quite what I'm. So apparently, I don't know if this is the take they used, but apparently, Siegel went off for like twenty minutes, wrote the song, came back, did the scene. And Rogan had never heard the song before. He wrote a completely new song, the Lady L song that we hear. Lady and uh, so the <laughs> reaction obviously was in the script, but his facial expression, actually, all of that is genuine. Really? So, all right, well, all right. Which we'll get into. I, I guess see, I'm right, sort of showing no, my hand well, too much no, on this episode. No, I mean, but. This, that's fine. That, see, I, all right, I thought this was going to be a short one, but apparently I was way wrong well, already. Well, here but, we go. But all right, here's another question. <laughs> yeah. Because th that's an interesting thing. All right, that... 
that sells that scene so well for me. So well. But here's the question. This is the classic Revenant, Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay. Argument. Shouldn't have gotten that Oscar. Is yes, that, he that should. Have. Well, 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 for a different movie, maybe. Well, okay, <laughs> even for that movie, as hardcore and cool as it was. Okay. The argument is like, was he really acting then? If Seth Rogen's response is his actual response, I say they're using that. Yeah, artistically it works, but is that a good performance? Then technically, no. Um, I would say yes, okay. because it's not like he busted out laughing and said, "What the f are you?" So he still singing? stayed in character. I mean, he was still in character, and he still did what he was told to do, which okay. is just be deadpan, be deadpan. Sarcastic. But you can tell on his face that <laughs> He's this genuine is ridiculous. Shock. Um, and then he said the line at the end of the scene. Okay, you know that he was supposed to say or had the reaction he was supposed to. So Leo um, eating a horse liver and. Uh, you know, having frostbite. That's not technically Ugh. acting. So, so... No, I don't that's know. That's Is that cheating? No, I Getting think it's all the acting. Character? Listen, listen, okay. <laughs> He's not actually Like, for example, <laughs> I don't know, like, a, a one-man show or something on Broadway that's scripted. Uh-huh. I think that's still acting. Because sure. you put that together. But a stand-up comedian like Chappelle, who doesn't necessarily script everything, he just goes out there and sometimes just talks off the top of his mind. That's not acting because that's... That's oh, more of the common, stand-up monologue, routine monologue, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, speaking, but I don't know. I, I think look, acting as yourself is still acting too. Keep I, that in mind. As a version of yourself, well, everybody acts a little like. I see what you're saying. I you know what, what I mean? Right. Like, okay, so, okay. So, all right. all right. So basically, Seth Rogen did a good job. I, I, think I so. agree. Yeah. I just thought it was an interesting. I yeah, because you told that me that interesting side. Uh, um, no, but basically, here's the thing, though. As far as the synopsis goes, let's get yeah, let's get actually into it's, the it's, episode. I've given yeah, so much so, of the, so many, but the, no, it's okay the because the synopsis for this episode is incredibly simple. Actually, yeah, it's incredibly simple. I mean, uh, I guess. Oh, what is the A story? Well, because I don't know. I think they're both pretty pretty important. I think I'm going to say I Bill. Think this is a, both, I, I guess Bill, but I think this is a double A. Uh, du- because the Millie better. story, I think the Millie story has more layers to it because you've got the Jason Siegel part. You've got the dog part, and you've got Millie going in yes. with the freak. So I, I think I would say it's a double A, because I think both stories probably get more time. I mean, Pretty, uh, probably get the same amount of time, but I think there's actually more going on. I mean, the the geek story is so simple yeah, to dissect. It's very simple, uh, or to you know uh, talk synopsize. Well, yeah, but yeah, well, basically. Uh, yeah, Bill. I guess let's do that one first because it yeah. is easier it's, to talk I about. Think, I think we're going to go all over the place yeah. probably. But okay. but, but Bill, uh, basically... It, the Who we Bill, just met his mom last week. Yeah, and he when almost... He, when he was in the hospital. Bill, Bill's having a lot going on there, uh, lately. A couple Bill, of Bill episodes. Bill almost... Your favorite character. Yeah, actually. Uh, yeah. Bill... See, I said Bill was the MVP and I, I think I'm. I think the writers are starting to agree with me. Yeah. They're really liking Bill. Um, but, well, as... as the bully said in this episode. He's the man. Haverchuk's He's the, the king. king. Haverchuk's the king. I never king. thought I'd say this, but Haverchuk's the king. Well, well I mean. <laughs> that was a great line. I, I, I want to try to hold my thoughts. All right. I do have a lot to say hold, about Hold Bill. the thoughts. I, I, I like what they did. But, but, but the basic synopsis is. It's, it's basically Coach Biff. Coach Biff is, from Back to the Future is dating, dating his mom. Bill's mom. And there is this Bill's territorial. Bill's former stripper mom. <laughs> yes. Which we officially but found out, out this episode. So she definitely was into some, you know, more, uh. Uh, I more guess adult stuff. More adult as, things. And to get uh, to make money, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely a little risque. Uh, and, uh, well, there's some territorial stuff there because Coach Biff is in the house. Uh, well, and him and Bill obviously don't really get along because Bill's not very adept at sports. No. They had that heart-to-heart a few episodes ago where... Trying to do the baseball. Trying to... Um, let me see let, what I can yeah, do. Yeah, let me see what I can do. Assumptions. Um, and we've seen him be nice before as well with Sam, Sam and the sex ed stuff. Yeah, that's why I was like, I didn't think by this point he was like so hated by them, but but we'll get to it. We'll I get think. to but it. But ba- basically there's that and Bill's having a hard time with it. And even the school, he's hard. starting to actually talk back to the teacher, but like, you can't make me run laps because he thinks he can get away with it. And Biff... It's very uncomfortable for both of them, and their yeah. roles uh, ha- have kind of been shaken. Well, a okay, bit. here's because here's the thing. Oh, right, uh, uh, see, see, first, we, and then I think we'll we'll dive in. Yeah, we'll dive in after that. We'll just dive. Uh, okay. But basically, there's that, and Biff just tries to find a way to get through to him. 
they go go karting. Yep, they've been trying. They've been like begging they, all their parents to go go karting. And Obviously, he's actually, Mr. Weir's not going to let that happen. So, so, so Biff, Biff takes, Biff takes like Biff takes them. They're having a good time. Neil and Sam are actually more supportive by that point. The guy, he's kind of cool. Yeah, he gets them like little joke things. Like yeah, they food. go to the joke shop. Uh, yeah, he tries he tries to relate to basketball. They don't agree, so he tries the joke things. Bill finally starts to come around. But, you know, Biff's very competitive because he is still kind of a sportsman. Yeah. Rams into Bill, goes into some hay, and Bill's actually very, very upset about this. Very upset. And then they... Tells him he hates him. Tells him hate him. You don't care about anybody else just winning. They'll think about yep. his feelings, which, you know, isn't really about Biff. You know, obviously. It, you know, obviously. Yeah. And so, you know, and then there's kind of, there is kind of a, you know, sort of a, a heart to heart at the end. Yeah, the Where they, they kind of start to do that. Well, there's that, which is... Probably my favorite scene of the episode, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill, Bill starts Bill, to cry. Bill, Mike Starr's acting was, was pretty damn good. Yeah, very right? good acting. And uh, and uh, but then they finally do kind of come together with Dallas when they start to pick up the yes. the characters and, and they, turns off the game for they've them. been mentioning Dallas, Bill's Bill and Bill's Dallas. love of Dallas. Friday nights on CBS, um, competing network. Oh, um, but that's been since the second episode. Where yes. he doesn't want to that's do the, a, the party stuff a, with the beer because he's going to miss, miss Dallas. Dallas. He's, he's such a big um, fan. And he's mentioned a couple times watching Dallas with his mom. So it's a big bonding thing. Did you pick up on that You know, from, from when they said that? I actually didn't, but now it makes the opening scene make a lot more sense. And the I was opening like, scene where he's... Um, going through his routine. Yes, doing the grilled cheese... That's straight out of Apatow's life, apparently. And it's just like watching it. He's, he's like so Patrick happy. Kid. Did you recognize the uh, comedian he was watching on TV? You know, I know who he is, and I know you like him. And Love I, him. I forget his name. He, yep. The only reason I know is because I know him in his older days because he was the evil senator in Iron Man. Yes, so, okay. What I, that did, I didn't know name? you would recognize him. What was that guy's name? Because he had a full head of hair and in I was the like, 80s. I was like... Oh, yeah, it's that guy. Ga Gary Shandling. Gary Shandling. Who, yeah, he passed maybe three years what? ago. Yeah, he, he died... Not young, but in the 60s of, uh, I think, oh, cancer. Damn. Um, wow. But yeah, it, but yeah I, guy, I didn't know if you'd recognize it because he looks no, very different in the early 80s than I, he did in Iron I was Man, looking for TV and I'm like, that nose. I'm like, it's that guy yeah. younger. Dan's going to bring him up. Yep. Yeah. Love yeah. him. Neil, that guy. He, that guy's cool. So and, I, and he and Apatow, uh, I, I don't know if they knew each other before this episode, but they were great friends the last 15 years of Shandling's life. So, so he's clearly a fan of his stand-up or whatever. He's a big fan of his early stuff. That's yeah. awesome. So. No, well, see, obviously, the, the creators are putting the love of their childhood. Yep. And now all the experience... It's, another you know, reason it's great. You know, yeah, I you know. almost looked up if Gary Shandling was doing daytime TV 81. circuit in 81 and I was like you know what just, I looked just, up last week and they because I didn't think that SNL bit existed they, yet they focus and they, they always know they get they, it down they always get it right so I didn't even look it up I don't think there is in any show that I, I know you're a stickler for that of mm -hmm. any show I've ever seen this is by far the most consistent about getting dates and, and placement absolutely. things absolutely like they really did Yep. Look this up so absolutely. probably was running that day or they something probably, it, right they probably <laughs> picked the exact day of the week Yep, oh, I, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and basically he picks up with like you know talking. He turns off the game for him. Yeah, compromise when they sit on the couch and he's into it. Starts mentioning the characters, what the motivations are, and he's like, "Oh, I'll tell you more about it when the commercial." And then smile and okay, there. Yeah, maybe that was can, a nice moment. I want, that was a very good moment. A little, just a little push in that direction. Yeah. So yeah, um, so that was that story. That was so that, that story. Dissect it. So well, Coach I mean, Beth, of course. No, See, I, will, I will tell you this. Tom, Thomas Wilson, who plays Coach Biff, was also on the commentary. And he said that the worst part of doing a show with actual geeks is that Neil, Sam Levine in real life, uh, the guy that plays Neil, would not stop asking him Back to the Future questions. <laughs> he kept asking him about the DeLorean and the hoverboards and the was that real manure and this and that and the other. And he he, he he was laughing about it in the commentary. And he was like, man, those, those first couple weeks I was on set. This kid. It was un you know, he was like, it was well, unbearable. <laughs> well, that's the great thing about, you said about Neil, is that is him. He's lost It's all him, and that's how he got that job. That's you so, know, just from being doing a shatter pretty impression pretty <laughs> in the, uh, in the that's audition. That's what got it, you know, that was... But that's great. But yeah, so but that was that's, a nice little nugget for you. That that is a great nugget, yeah. actually. That's really cool. No, uh, I I think okay. I remember you said you weren't a big fan of Coach Biff before, which surprised me. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's actually one thing 
that, not necessarily about you. I mean, you can answer, okay. but that was Tell me. one thing that sort of confused me about it was I, I didn't think there was going to be that much resistance to him overall. Like everyone was saying he's such a jerk, and I was like, by this point, I don't think they'd hate him that much, especially with Sam. Well, here's well, the Sam thing. does defend him first. Sam defends him yeah. when he comes into the room and is like, hey, like, guys, hey, like, yeah. do you want to whatever? And he kind of defended him even Before when Bill told him. He was like, oh, he's, he's not that He's bad. like, he's all right. Yeah. So I think Sam's fine with him. <laughs> um, but I think, look, Bill has always had issues with him, and they sort of got temporarily resolved. tabled or resolved when that one episode happened. But... You know, at the end bottle. of the day, they st- right, it's a bottle episode, but they still got their butt kicked in the game. They got that one great run, and then they still got their butt kicked in the game. So Maybe the, nothing's really been solved. That's what I mean. The thing about Coach Biff and <laughs> high school coaches and, and gym teachers, I think in general, certainly at that time. I thought I had is some nice gym teachers. The, well, that's good, but you went to school 20 years after these kids did. That's true. I only went 10, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little closer to it. But yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think. Look, I didn't hate my gym teachers necessarily, but I was not a good student in gym. We've talked about that. Yeah. And so, to me... Wouldn't be your favorite look, teacher. they were just trying to do their job and get you to move around. Get in shape. And, ru- you know, yeah. run the mile or walk sense. the mile or, or, you know, pick yeah. up a racket or whatever. Yeah. And I think kids like me and like Bill that are not very physically adept... Um, just look at that as this brutal punishment and like F this guy and da, 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 da. and it's really it's not the teacher's fault. That's what they're paid to do. Yeah. They need to get your blood flowing and you know, whatever. And so it seems like they're a little harsh and maybe sometimes they are, certainly in that era. But you know, look, at the end of the day, um you know, Sam had his ups and downs with them because they had the sex ed talk, but then after that was the shower episode. True. Where they, you know, he had to take the showers and then he was kind of his enemy again. And so I think by nature of mm. the gym teacher. Can't all, had to be at odds with him if you're a You geek. have to kind of be at odds with him. Okay. If you're a geek. Or if you're Gordon, you don't care. <laughs> Gordon doesn't care. I don't I don't think Neil really cares either. Not really. You know? No, he's fine with um, it. Yeah. Doing whatever. But of course, you know, Bill has that well, stigma attached to him not being physically athletic, but then to come home and find out from your mom that she's dating basically your, your least favorite teacher. teacher. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's I, not cool. His believe it's believable, like his reaction. And then he decides to okay, fine, you're gonna have him to dinner. I'll give him a chance. I'll I'll play along, mom. And then the first conversation they have is about how stupid Stripes was and how oh, Bill Murray is yeah. an idiot person, and the yeah. worst, and he needs to get his ass kicked. And this is like Bill's comedy. I mean, this is like Steve Martin loves, to uh, yeah. to Sam. Sam yeah. So it's like <laughs> they're not they're not clicking. So right away, bad hey, bad clicking. I don't know though. I liked his choice for best movie though. I thought Rocky Two wasn't a bad choice. It's but it's one of the such ones. but it's such a jock thing to say thing to say and feeding into Bill's uh, in, idea, perception, perception of him. Yes, yeah, for sure. Which is he wants to break and that which thing, listen doesn't go away either because like you said when they're in the car going to the go-kart track he's talking about hey guys who's your favorite basketball star well, da, da, right, da, da, da. Right, and that's the thing about he's trying coach, to coach Biff is trying but to he relate. doesn't know how well but he he uh has some flexibility though he learns like yes he does you know he yes he, but you're right he is kind of hoping like oh yeah like you know they maybe if i they do like basketball no they don't like he's not thinking right about that. they don't but that's his initial reaction and then he tries other things yeah you know so I, I can relate to that. And they love the go-karts. Love go-karts for a hit. That was fun. Ice cream he offers. People like ice cream. Offers the ice cream. Look, I think Coach Biff, in, in my adult age, I think Coach Biff is fine. Yeah, Coach Biff is fine. You know, I think in, in the different episodes, I mean, he's a little bit of a player, because obviously in the one episode we saw him chatting up the uh, the uh, this girls' field hockey coach or whatever it was, but I think... He might have some sort of real feelings for Bill's mom. And Seemed like it. He's obviously trying very hard because he doesn't really want to. It's I don't his think initial... he really likes Bill. No, probably you know? not his favorite. Likes well, and him. let's keep in mind in that episode where Bill did the the thing where he's like, "Oh, put me in," you know. He made all those prank phone calls to him. Yeah, they have a history. They they aren't fans. Yeah, yeah. of each other. That's true. That's yeah. true. 
So you're right. Yeah, you're you're right. That that's definitely a factor. But then he comes in the in the morning. Bill's trying to eat his count chocula. He comes. Class they pay for the episode. Biff goes. Yes. <laughs> Biff comes in his underwear uh, with t-shirt underwear. He walks in the kitchen, grabs the Bill mug. And start drinking yeah. from it as the mom comes in. And it's like, oh my I'm god! I'm here to stay, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, not a fan. Well, that's Bill. understandable. That's understandable. Like uh, that. That's definitely a weird place to be. Yeah, you know, I, I can relate to that for sure. The one good thing about it is Bill doesn't really know his dad, so it's not like not very well. No. It's not like this situation of oh, you're trying to replace my dad. Your dad doesn't really exist, Bill, you know, in the grand scheme of things, as we're learning. No, he's he's not really there that much. And right. I, clearly, there's some issues with absence there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and I think that's you know, definitely where some of the anger is coming from. Mm-hmm. He's directing Coach Biff, you know, but... Uh, he Like, I don't think he would have had the same reaction if she was dating guidance counselor Rosso. No, he would have loved that. You know? Yeah, so it's kind of like, oh, like, this is the person. So, I, yeah, so I don't think it's specifically... Some somebody is coming between me and my mom. It's I think this guy in particular. That's maybe like, a little piece of it, but yes, I think it's, it's more. Oh man, why this? Guy? It's Coach Beth. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, who has a name in the show? But we but just I don't call know him what Coach. We've called him. I really don't know what the character's name. They is. They said it many times. Coach Beth, I call him. I, it's just easier. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I I really. Is there, uh, is there anything else to talk about with that? I mean, uh, not really. I don't know. How'd you feel about that great scene at the end? You said it was your favorite scene, very emotional. Oh yeah, I just thought when uh, when he actually did come forward, Coach Biff was yeah. like, "Hey, you know, like, hey, I actually do love your mom. I'm trying." He apologizes, you know, and I thought Bill just like really just kind of, you know, was really upset about the whole thing, right? And obviously, he has a lot of emotions going on. There. I just thought the acting there was just great. Biff though was very sympathetic to him yes it wasn't like he was you know stop being a crybaby no when when he was saying like look you know your mom's had a rough couple of years and bill was like what would you know about it? he's like well, what you told only me only what she tells me but you're right da, you da, know da, more da, da. you know right like trying to kind of like show the boundaries there a little yeah the whole, the whole, it's about boundaries. i like coach biff no i thought i thought this was a very you know very realistic uh relatable thing for a lot of kids I yeah a lot of you know, a lot of adults, you know, kind of going into these single marriages. You know, it's it's a very common thing. So I think that that's something that there definitely were some good scenes out of. Yeah. And I, I liked the, the little ending, too, as well. I thought that was a good little scene. The Dallas and, part, and yeah. connected with Bill's montage, how that's kind of like his special place. He's kind of yes, used to, like, sort of domain. being by himself. Yeah. He, this is his home. And, you know, maybe this was a thing he did with his mom. Maybe his dad. We don't know with Dallas. Right. And, and I thought... Just, you know, and as being as people who really love our stories, we love our fiction, seeing him, like, really kind of getting attached to Dallas, invested, maybe getting yeah. a little lost in it. And just the, honestly, the soundtrack was good, but really just the, I mean, the, the editing and the way he was acting, the, the, the joy, the laughter, contrasted with how much sadness he had at the end. Like, yeah, the way in the episode. The yeah. way that was bookended, like, I just thought that so was, good, that right? was some really good visuals and just some simple emotional acting with like yeah. little dialogue well and, and i just loved that and you yeah. get i, I was, mean like we've talked about before we we get a lot about sam's home yeah. but the last couple of episodes we oh, had the yeah. episode with neil's dad now we've got and Bill, bill's mom we met her last night that's um what i wanted to bring up actually. Okay. i'm glad you reminded me is that that's something i really like that they've done with bill and i, I did kind of like him a lot but like he is He's kind of a great character because they have subtly built up to his story. Right. Like the yeah. little, the little droplet of oh, like dad's not around. One line an episode, and then okay, we little mention of his mom. Then we meet his mom, and it's just like yeah, we get the whole th- we get the whole thing. Even in this episode with very little, like about his dad, we still don't know. But yeah, they just do a lot with very little. In this yeah, show. like we don't know the details how recently they got divorced. We don't know if they were ever married to begin with. Like we don't know many things. But it doesn't really matter. But it doesn't matter because we know how Bill feels about it. Yes, and that's I just um, I thought that was great. Bill being home by himself, that like you said, sequence. like it's his domain, making the grilled cheese. He's got he's got his big piece of cake. And like it's milk. really it was he happy. His, Gary Chandling, but it was a little sad at the same time, and it was this great. Were you sad for him? A little bit, like, okay. Especially in retrospect, like not at first. Well, yeah, at first I, guess I thought he was happy, but like yeah. well, at the end, I'm like, oh, like okay. That this is kind of a comfortable place for him. Very comfortable. So, so I, I could I could see that. I thought there was a lot of interesting character stuff, especially in, in those two scenes. Yeah. 
the way they both ended it. I and like, and we're learning a lot about Bill, like you said. I the mean, last I think, couple episodes, yeah, like, geez, Bill, last three episodes, really, or two episodes end this. So yeah. It's like it's practically becoming the Bill show. Like, what the, happened? Right, Bill show. Um, that no one ever saw. Nobody ever saw this episode. Also, yeah, that's what I was saying. This is an episode that's never seen like this. Is, yeah. If you were a Bill fan, I mean, this is like... So by the way, so keep in mind, keep wow. this episode in mind because once we get to the last three episodes, keep in mind when they finally did air that summer on NBC, this episode still was not seen. So nobody would necessarily know the anything was... about this episode so with wait. this story or with the Millie and uh, Lindsay story so chronologically would this one take place after when Bill almost died yes okay yes chronologically the way we are watching them like is the way they were work. scripted and okay ordered because by John Abitow. when you said it was all around like so that weird line from the bully I was wondering so okay so he has like come around a little so they bit. did so they did have that, a, a yep. little a little nugget they of, did ah, have that exchange he's the king <laughs> that was a great line <laughs> That right. was great. And I love how the coach is like, screw you, shut up, I'm tired of it. But he's <laughs> yeah. the one that's He's the one who gets in no, trouble. All the quiet. <laughs> that was great. Because he knows he can't say anything to Bill. He can't really and, say anything and to the, Bill. And the subtleties of the boundaries and the power struggle there, I, yes. I, I like playing with that. It's too. great. That's what I'm saying. There's just well, because, okay. subtle and stuff. And Bill is the only one of the geeks who Usually, would do that. He's the only one of the geeks who would whatever. test those boundaries. Sam, go with the flow. Neil's like, oh, we got to fit in. Neil wants to fit in. Gordon doesn't care. Well, but because the, Gordon doesn't care, he wouldn't stand up that's, to anybody like that anyway. That's the weird thing is because on the surface, like the first episode. Right. I, I, first episode, I thought Bill was the most meek, you know, right. mellow guy. And he is. But he also will tell you what's on his mind. Yes. And if you mess with him, it, he, he will not deal with it. Correct. He, he will test those boundaries. Correct. <laughs> He'll go flirt with Sam's okay. girlfriend. <laughs> well, the, correct. This, okay, so this leads into really the only dovetailing of these two stories. You love a dovetail. I love because these episodes are designed usually to fit. fit. They do the, the episode titles, you know, one geek, one freak, whatever. All right. So this one does not have really anything to do with the Weir's uh, dovetailing. The Sam, st Sam doesn't really have a story. No. Lindsay's story does not have anything to do with what's going on with the geeks no, at all. Which is why I'm trying to so remember the dovetailing. where's the dovetailing? Now. I'll tell you. What's the connection? The connection is, is that of every single person in the show, and you hit the nose on the, or nail on the head with Bill always speaking his mind of, of the geeks... Of everybody else in the show, who is the only one who really speaks their mind without fear of persecution from friends, um, social status? Millie. Millie. Oh. So the dovetailing. That's good. And it's not something I realized that's until good. the commentary. That's good. Um, the dovetailing of this episode is actually Bill and Millie. That's interesting. The, the two kind sort of, of outliers from their groups. That nobody takes that seriously. That nobody takes that seriously, but they are they the have some serious only shit too. two oh. who, ever, <laughs> who ever really speak their mind without fear of anything. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. And certainly social social status. So they, they don't care. No. Because you might think, okay, well, Ken speaks his mind. Yeah, but Ken really is... Uh, he doesn't really He backs care, down, though. But he backs down yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, because he doesn't have much. <laughs> Kim Kelly speaks her mind, but yeah. she's very much into the social she structure. She wants to have friends. And, yes, you know. and she basically, as we've said, is the leader of the freaks. Yes. And she likes that role. Millie could care less about anything like that. That's true. Which is what makes this, to me, the most interesting Millie episode. You know, it's weird because um, with, with Millie, the, you know... What a character. They've covered a lot of... Ground. Sarah Hagen, by the way, we don't really talk about her very much. Oh, um, I did But she's, a, she's really great in this series. I, I didn't realize this because I was looking it up again. I didn't realize she was in Buffy for like a season. Was she? Yeah, I looked it up. She was apparently in season five or six, like 12, 13 episodes. Oh, the bad seasons. I've only, I, I've only seen them once. So, I, don't, I yeah, honestly I don't, don't remember. remember who she okay, was, but she was Jennifer, I think, or something. So oh, she that wasn't Buffy. familiar. Wow. So there you go. Uh, tell her which was a Buffy. There you go. I remember, I forget. But yeah. no, I, I think that's weird you say that because we've gotten, like with Bill, we've gotten mm. a lot of good Millie stuff lately. Yeah. And 
Once well, again, because I think they're exploring more now side some of the side characters. Yeah. We've gotten really... I mean, Sam is great, and I love him. We've covered a lot of ground. But we've covered a lot of ground there. Um, you know, Lindsay's a perennial. We'll always cover ground with her. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Neil, we, you know, we had a big standalone episode with him and the dad. We got a big one. Um, so I think we're exploring more of these... The world. Uh, I mean, we even had a Ken episode. That was great. And, we, and Ken has got a little more doing this one, which I like. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. So, but basically, yeah, Millie, all right, it starts off. Yeah, so, th- I mean, this is very. This is another intense <laughs> one. Or, or, or funny. We're 40 guess, minutes in, and uh, this synopsis is going to take five minutes because there's so much going on well, with the freak storyline. Well, look. Okay. Right? Yeah, there is. Because <laughs> there's three stories, like look, you said. The yeah, dog. I swore The Who you, concert. I thought right. this was going to be a short one. I knew this would be a talker. Oh, no. All right. Well, basically, okay. Well, it starts out actually with the Who concert. Coming conversation. To town. Yes, we're going to see the. Hoodle. That's the only time we see everybody at the kitchen table at the Weir House. Oh yes, because the parents are not going to let Lindsay go. Yeah, because they're afraid the concert. booze too intense and they're yes. going to listen to the record. Well, and this was shortly after uh, the death, the famous like death at the Rolling Stones concert. Oh. Um, so, which is why he mentions, "Oh, why don't you go see the Rolling Stones at Altamont next?" <laughs> That's where that happened. Uh, so that was within a year or two of that. I didn't think the Stones um, were that hardcore. Dang. Well, it was. Different that time. was uh, the start, actually, of yeah. general admission. Oh, anybody could just. Go so out. people would rush the stage, and people would get either trampled or pushed up against, and it still happens today. It happened at a Pearl Jam concert like ten years ago. Oh, jeez. Um, and, and people would get pushed against the stage or whatever. So. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they're they're kind of afraid for her to go. Right. And uh, I guess she. Well, she. Why um why are her and uh, Kim going out? Is there a particular reason at night? I forget what they're doing. Um. So do they mention? It doesn't really matter. I don't know. They're just going. I don't out, remember. They're just going out driving and uh, they're talking and they hit something and they say, "I oh, we're gonna go and we're gonna not see what it is." Lizzie thought it was a squirrel. Squirrel. Oh, and whatever. She really wanted to go back and see. And Kim but was Kim's like, like it's ah, fine. "That's fine. What's one last squirrel?" Next day. Millie's really upset. Why? Because her dog died. Somebody hit it, and they just ran off. Ooh, and then yep. Kim. Great, great shot that where easily. she's out of focus the whole time, but you can still clearly see her reactions. Oh no! And Kim Kelly feels so bad about horrible. This, and this was a great scene when great she Kim told. Uh, well, they Actually. all are. <laughs> um, but when she told, I guess it was Ken, uh, about the dog. And she's like, oh, you know, and he was, it was Ken, because it's classic Rogan <laughs> reaction. He was just like, so what? It's a dog. Dogs are stupid. Dogs hate like, us. They, they, just, they just, just, they just, they beat up. You know, look, I'm not a dog person. But I'm a cat person. Like... So to me, I was like, you go, Ken. Like, you're right. They're dirty. You got to take care of whatever. And Kim was like, shut up, Ken. Like, I, you know, that's worse than killing a human. Like, da, 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 da. What? And I know a lot of people that feel that way. Some people love their animals more. I know a lot of hey, people that feel that way. My, my fiance has often says, you know, don't mess with my cats. You yes. Know? It, it, yes. So, so, you know. And we know some people that, like, if you murder a hundred people in a movie, who cares? But you kill, you that kill dog. John Wick's dog and, oh, my God, like, you're out. Well, it's the innocence of the animal. I guess so, So, in yeah. a weird way, I could see that. It's like, what did the dog do? Well, and, so, look, yeah, they yeah. can't write that Kim's happy about it. No. You know, they can't write that Kim doesn't care that she killed this dog. This this eats at her. Which I like. It really yeah. does, because you see more vulnerability in this episode for her than you'd have probably since... Well, because I don't uh, think Daniel would have cared. No. Seth uh, Rogen <laughs> clearly wouldn't have cared. And uh, Nick... Would have been stoned. Jason Siegel would, <laughs> would have been, oh, just, I'm so upset about, about Lindsay. <laughs> you know, he doesn't oh. care. So it had to be Kim that did it. That's okay. You know? But, uh, yeah, and uh, that there's basically... That's going to be the... They're not going to tell her, though. Right. And they're going to just, uh, what, what is it they... But because they don't tell her, and Kim feels so bad, she starts befriending her. Yes, and they bond a little. So much so that Millie invites them to the the funeral. Yes, and they, they go to it, and, and Lindsay feels bad, too, of course, because she's Horrible. lying. What she wants to tell her. She wants to tell her. Kim's like, you know, just, just say something, and they say stuff, and they bond uh, over, like, I guess Kim talks about her dog that died. And right. Down. So right. it's kind of cool. They actually sort of come together. Right. And and then and, she invites Millie to the Who concert. The Who concert. And even though, of course, Millie is, you know, straight laced, super yeah. art with, with her mom. Seals and Crofts. Actually. <laughs> Again. Which, by the way, 
they play at the end of this episode when her and Lindsay are looking at the picture of the dog. Oh, man. The, so another great callback. It was a good little scene. Yeah. But the thing is, we get we get Rebel Millie in this episode. Yeah. Who I like, by the way. I like, well, I like Rebel, Rebel, Rebel Millie. Rebel Millie decides adorable. <laughs> that she, she's adorable. She's going to drink beer. She's like, look, you know, I'm Lindsay, always good. you left me for these people. I want to see what the fuss is about. Oh, you know? also a good little moment, though, is... Lindsay obviously really wants to tell Millie. Yeah. Kim is like, no, you, you don't do that. I know that you feel guilty because you could just bounce back with your good friends if you don't like us. So right. you're not, you're not going to tell that her. That was it. Like, yes, she, I'm glad she, like, you remember she, like, that. threatens her. That in was way, a really she interesting knows part. The insight of like why, like how Lindsay's yeah. always kind of playing both sides if yes. something doesn't work out. Right. So that was and a she's good not line. wrong. It's a very it she a good line. Told her what was up. Like, yeah. don't you tell her or I'll kill you. Basically, she does say she'll kill her. So which no, she, she says she'll beat her up. Beat her up. But well, yeah, basically. But to Kim, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because that that is a very telling line. About where Lindsay is, mm -hmm. that right? She chooses her Placement. friendship, yeah, like her place in both groups, situationally, oh, situationally over telling Millie the truth. Yes, she wants to keep both of her friends, yeah, friend groups, uh, so she won't actually tell the truth. Right. That 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 is a good point. Yeah. She cares so much about being in the group, and at, at, at the end of the episode, once Millie does find out, uh, it turns out, you know. They're still friends. Like it didn't. It didn't. I mean, I'm sure she's heard about it. But she didn't have. But she was genuinely worried she might lose Millie as a friend. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know. So that says something that she didn't have as much. Well, look, Millie uh, saved her ass in the Choking the Token episode. episode. So, so there you, know, you go. She really wants her. Around, yeah. You know, and that's perfectly fine. But yeah. But of course, things. Uh, well, I know. I like the scene when the mom comes up. We meet her mom when she's about to go to the bus. That's that they right. Found, the uh, who is an actress, uh, an actress who I love, Megan Fay. She was on a couple episodes of Roseanne as the nasty neighbor. Oh. She did uh, one of the Carol Burnett like redo shows where they tried to do a different Carol Burnett show. She was on that. Oh. Um, so she's been around a while, and that just always kind of pops so, up. And she's she plays a great like uptight. Uh, yes, uptight. Stick up her butt. Yes. Parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do like that Millie... I, I was, co like, honestly, quite with Millie. I was like, you know, I'm always good, yeah. straight A's. Like, I never do anything. I'm 15. I can start. Right. You know? So, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, at this point, I so... I get the point. Well, we meet Millie's mom, right. Uh, she comes up because they're, like... they concert. They're they think she's allowed to go. They're pre-tailgating or whatever uh, with, <laughs> with the, beers with the and bus. Stuff, right? The bus that Daniel rented or whatever. They, yeah, um, somebody got it from an auction or and, something. And uh, we should talk briefly, as an aside, about the, the scene oh, where they listen to the it. Who record. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. There's there's a couple subplots. All right. We haven't even gotten to everything. Very good. See? Those layers. I know. I told, you, you, I told you just that synopsis will take a while. Uh, no, I was just going to say about the, the them listening to the Who oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. album. But we can talk about that. Um, so, yes, at this point, Lindsay is like, well, I'm going to – I'm. Tr she's trying to convince her parents to let her go. And finally, the, the, the final nail is – well, Millie's mom's letting her go, mm -hmm. which of course we learn is not really true. No, not true. She was lying. Not true at all. But um, like at this point, Millie yeah. just had so much going on. She's like, you know, why not? I'll yeah. just start, you know, relaxing basically. Yeah. Not caring as much about grades. Like, yeah, actually, right. Go to the concert. So I thought that was interesting, but you know, eventually it comes out. You know that. Uh, well, she's about to drink her first beer, ever. and that's that's when Lindsay. That's like, the well. That's the breaking point for Kim. For Kim, yeah. Kim, yeah. Kim's like, I kill, I kill as she try, like brings the bottle to her lips. Like whatever, bottle I killed your dog. Just like she's like, you know, this doesn't seem right. You know, yeah. like it's like Millie's probably not ready for this. She's being destructive, almost like didn't feel right. So, what did you think about Kim in that moment? A good person. Yeah, definitely. Because you know the, the, her conscience got the better of her. Eventually, she, you know, yeah, because she realizes that there's so much good in Millie. Can't after now, be after now be friends so quick, right? <laughs> They've already kind of corrupted Lindsay. Like she just does not want to do corrupt this. this girl. So you think she feels bad about Lindsay being with them? Well, she obviously has issues with herself. Like why? Who, Kim? Yeah. Well, I think. Like, why would she feel so bad about uh, Millie joining their group? Dishes? Because look, I think she has a lot of guilt about the dog. Obviously, yeah. Um, I and I just think. You know, the conversation Lindsay had with them episodes ago mm -hmm. about you guys aren't going anywhere, da 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 
permeates throughout the rest of this series. That's true. You know what I mean? That, that, that's so true. with that in the back of Kim's mind, what kind of person of everybody at that school who be. has more of a shot at success than Millie, mm-hmm. at least academically. That's true. You know, and so they don't want to see Sabotage. her go down that path because of something that Kim did. All right, that's fair. You know, that's fair. No, that's a good point. See, a lot of uh, insight there. Very, that's really yeah, good. That's what I think. But uh, yeah, you're right. They do make up though, and of course, Millie, you know, actually is. Uh... Now, first of all, when you s- did, did you get a look at the picture of the dog that they show at the end of this episode? That dog. dog could. All right, all right. You okay. would have known if you ran over that dog. Okay. That was a ridiculous part right, of the right. show. Actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, I did not. <laughs> they think... were making fun but... of that of the commentary, and I was just like, right, yeah, right. that's like a Marmaduke-sized dog. All right. You okay. would feel right. it. You know, I actually didn't think about it because I just watched it, but now that I'm picturing the dog. Right? I'm going to call it so far. Okay. It's the worst writing in Freaks and Geeks. Yeah. Because I'm like, I thought it was a little dog. That's what happens like, when Paul Feig like, is not around. Like, if Marmaduke, <laughs> if Marmaduke, if you hit Marmaduke, your your card's yes. gonna be messed up. You might that not is be a the little bad. Bump, it was that a was a bad, bad decision. Part, yeah. That, why did they do that? Actually, I don't know. I guess they didn't think anybody was gonna pay attention. They guys, listen, you know better. That was okay. You know what? Listen, it wasn't even aired originally. So what did they think? <laughs> I didn't think about it, but now I'm like, wow, that that is actually a big, almost a lot. Yeah. Of Clearly, they wanted you to feel bad that she lost this. You know, big dog that she loves so much. You can have a little dog. But you, you can love. have a little dog that you love too. That's a lot more. And maybe visually, yeah. it was it was better. I don't with know. The, they, but somebody had two kids with the dog. That looks dear sad. Lord, like that was that was enormous dog. Bad scene. Bad scene. Bad right. <laughs> well, not bad scene. The scene well, itself. The was scene okay. was good, but that that, but that plot, little that visual choice was bad. Bad part. Yeah. That, that was a poor decision. Which the first time I think I've said anything significantly negative about, about this, this show, episode, that's which true. is a very minor that's thing. True. But you're right. That's like what? Yes. Okay. But anyway. All right. I'm glad so, that um, that was resolved. So let's I'll talk about this. the music now in this the episode. Who? There's the Who, and then there's the song by Jason Siegel. Um, yes, so that's the last The Who, thing. I think, was a great scene. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weir finally decided, okay, we'll listen to the Who record. Was accordion. He tells her, <laughs> he tells Lindsay, we'll listen to the Who if it's, if we don't find it objectionable, you can go. And then, of course, he says, I'm going to listen to it backwards, too. Yeah, I don't bother Zeppelin. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was back in that era. But, um, but yes, they listen to Squeeze Box, which, you know, famously is about effing yeah but the mom but, so uh, pure she thinks it really is about which, an accordion but, which is the double entendre that's what they want you to think and it's funny too because um, sure th- the thing that's hilarious about it though is because the weirs are so old-fashioned that this probably seems hardcore to them but even by the standards of the time there was much more yeah I questionable guess. stuff but this. like you know what's funny like i who knows what Lindsay thought of the song I don't know. You know, like okay. So my my example of me being a dumb naive kid. Okay. And uh, you know, I mean, you know me. I was getting it early, but this song came out, and I never understood what the double meaning was for like twenty years. Aerosmith, "Love in an Elevator." Look, living it up while I'm going down. I never put that together. That that's about effing in an elevator. Look. I mean, I, I know love in an elevator, but, like, the, the, the meaning of the words, sometimes you don't think about it when I, you're 14, look, you know, uh, 15, whatever. A lot of times growing up when I would listen to music, I didn't pay that much attention right. to the lyrics. To so who knows if honest. Lindsay, and Lindsay is only really half into this kind of music anyway, she's kind of faking it to be, to be cool. So she doesn't, so like, she doesn't think that much about it. It's very possible. They don't address it in the episode, but I think it's entirely possible. She, know. she has no idea she's fairly what this song is about. Considered. But yeah, it's pretty... Mr. It's, Weir picks it up immediately. It's kind of cool he did pick it up, though, actually. Oh, yeah. But I just think <laughs> I just think that, thinking that it's the who, you know, it's it's just, it's so tame. The, even by the st- even by that back then, I, I think it's well. Tame. I will say, I think it's really tame. When I first heard this song, I was probably eleven or twelve. Okay, it was explained to me what it meant because I sure wouldn't have figured it out. Okay, uh, I would have thought accordion. Um, I really was like, oh my god, like they're talking about that in a song. Like <laughs> holy god! Now you know, of course, this is right before. George Michael's I Want Your Sex came out. I mean, when yeah. it was very blatant and all of that. I'm but just saying, these days, it's, I just, it's like... These, these days, it's nothing. When the show was on, it was nothing. But in 1980... Maybe. I don't know. You know, I mean, I think there were more drug references in songs than sex. 
In, uh, you know, like the doors come on, well, baby, right. let's get I, higher. I guess, you know, I guess like what I'm thinking about is a lot of like the, airplane. the 70s metal stuff is a lot more darker. There, there's, I don't know if there's as much sex in, you're right, maybe there isn't that much sex. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's more, yeah, like drugs or demonic, imagery. demonic stuff more than sex. You know, I, so, you know, well, unless it's like funk or what? Yeah, I get, yeah, maybe that's true. Yeah, it's sort of like so. Kiss had a couple of more dirty songs yeah, for sure yeah, but yeah, yeah. I don't know I guess you're right but the point is to, to them it was big deal very very sexual yes um, and it was funny and it was great scene very mm-hmm. funny but, um, the, but the best scene but the best song of the episode <laughs> didn't come from the who it came from our own Nick Andopoulos right. called Lady L Dude, I'll tell you something uh, can I tell you something well, uh, oh, yes I, I want you to I'd like to okay well you know Bill I, I'll tell you something okay Two, Two things happened to me this episode that have not happened thus far. Really? Okay. The Bill scene, I actually got a little teary. Yeah, very and emotional. I, I got a little teary when, yep. when he was sad. I was like, that did hit me a little bit. Okay. And on the other end of the spectrum, that scene had me rolling. I haven't oh laughed God. this hard. What a when, scene. Like, when, and it was just, how about, how about my favorite action. line? By Kev afterwards, that was when oh, when he was like Lady L, and, and L. Nick's like, like well, I couldn't put her name in it. You could put your right, name. And on Kev it. was like, I don't think you should put your name on it. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, you know, I thought it was pretty good. Really? No, it was terrible. How about when <laughs> then he Nick is going to play it for, him. and he destroys the Ken guitar. straight up pretends he's Pete Townsend and destroys the guitar, which by the but, way he had to go to the hospital for. Really? Seth Rogen still has a scar on his chin because uh, so the one the, right the strings. One of the strings Snaps. sliced him when he was breaking the guitar. All right, Seth Rogen, that's so, hardcore acting. Still has a little stuff. scar underneath his chin there. See, I respect. Can't that. see it, I guess, because of the beard. But he's under there. Yeah, that's that's wow, good on him. See, that's hardcore. See? That's hardcore. Very hard. And I will say, this. and they didn't stop filming. Then keep rolling. <laughs> it's blood. Keep rolling. They actually cut away because you could really see the blood. Apparently, wow. Um, from what they said in the commentary, and so uh, Siegel goes over to him in character and still like does the lines. But um, there's a deleted scene where they let the scene keep going, and he's like, "Dude, are you okay?" <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you know what? He actually voiced something that I was thinking as he was destroying the guitar. Tell me. I was thinking, "Wow, that's he did him a favor." And he's like, "That's the biggest favor I did." Yeah. And I also he said realized that, yeah. something for Ken. That is the first truly selfless thing he's ever done. It was still in his very... The that we've seen, yeah, that's true. It was obviously in kind of a, you know, sort of a double standard for his own sake. He doesn't really care much about anything, but, but... he actually was like, if you play this in front of her, like, you're never... That good. was not that's for his own sake. Yeah. That was not for his own sake. Yeah. That was 100% for Nick's. Which I like that. I like that that was purely... Yeah. He, he was like, this is so bad. If you do this in front of her, yeah. this is terrible. I mean, I, Don't okay. do it. It's I a guess, little bit for his I own guess sake maybe he was, hated it. Well, he hated it, but I think maybe it was more for his sake because... He, if Lindsay reacted the way that he thought she would, that uh, Ken thought she would, then Ken would have to hear Nick moping around for, for, for another three so months or whatever. Might have been strategic. So maybe it's a little bit but, for his but benefit. But the way but I interpreted, I was like, you know what? I think it's it was a for, bit, for Nick. Bit of growth, and I yeah. actually liked the Ken Nick dynamic. We didn't see too much of that directly. No, at this point, so I I liked that. I yeah, there was they had a good little subplot there. Yeah, so there's some good stuff for Ken too. Yeah, like, good I, Ken episode. Yeah, um, you know, Lady so, L, horrible song, classic. I think is, and now we get a backstory behind that. Release the single of that Please. somewhere. That'd be no, great. Get, Digital. Get out of I would listen to it. I thought it was great. There is an extended version on the DVD. And I really loved it's how... a three and a half minute version of Lady Out. I'm, I'm, it's awesome he played that because it did sound really terrible. But believably, terrible. like some guy, he's putting his heart into it. He says, put my oh, emotions yeah. into it. Yes, I can tell. But all the psychos yeah. put emotions into things all the time. God, is that what he said? He said, hey, I know psychos <laughs> that put emotions right. into things. See, Ken has some great lines. Ken has some good lines, as always. But, um, yeah. Possibly improvised. We don't know. But either way, they're great. Um... But yeah, that was a great scene. Yeah, that, was, that whole, that was that whole really good. the guitar bit, the song Lady L bit was great. Yeah. So. Uh, all right. What else? We're we're running up to the hour mark. Uh, so I let's get our final thoughts before we grade it. I don't. I don't think there was anything else I needed to well, talk about. What's weird, Dan, is I was thinking that this was going to be just a good episode, and now I don't know if I. It, I, I don't. Wow. <laughs> I was like, L- listen. I don't a- think this is a phenomenal episode. No, I and mean, I'm not leaning like, on the AA plus. 
like tip. like the bill uh, but, the bill uh, stuff like was well done, but but it was very much like I'm sure we've seen a lot yeah, of it before. Pretty standard, um, but, pretty standard uh, jealousy type stuff. But there's like a lot of little um, things that are just uh, very good. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think for me the the best part of the episode is the Millie stuff. Yeah, it's really good. Um, you know, and she really gets to stretch a little bit, and she's so innocent; she doesn't even know why Kim wants her to bring her huge coat to the record store. You know, where Lindsay <laughs> tries to tell her, like, okay, please don't bring your huge coat. Um, yeah, I, I thought that uh, that gave her some growth. Um, I mean, at the end, by the end of the episode, everything is completely status quo with yeah, the freaks. of course. You know, um, but with Bill, maybe not. But with pretty much everybody, I think, but Bill, everybody's back to normal in this episode. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think this is... An incredibly groundbreaking episode, but how about that dovetailing? Good dovetail uh, between Bill and uh, Millie, which uh, you know, some episodes never saw that coming. No, that was a, I guess, thematic a character dovetail. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, that that was interesting. So there was a connection between because Lindsay and Sam had nothing together in this episode. Yeah, the at Weirs all. really didn't have much to do no. with the story, and for this, like you could have taken them out, and it wouldn't have really affected anything. Um, I mean, it, it was good for the who part. It was, um, but... Because like, you did well, need to believe that she would be allowed to go, and her saying, with I want to help Millie... Oh, that was a good uh, part, actually. was good. When uh, she's trying to convince uh, her when parents... Oh, mom's like, oh, you're such a good good girl. No, oh, no. No, no well, not that well, part. That part, part. When, uh, when Lindsay's saying, I want to go to the concert, you know, you know, like, trust me, Millie's going. Oh, okay, yeah. Millie's going, it's fine. That's the, that's the level of... Well, yeah, they were Millie's like, well, going. if Millie's parents are letting her go, then, yeah. It's fine. Well, because they obviously know that Millie's mom is very hardcore, very strict. And, of course, we know later in the episode that that never happened. And no. Millie <laughs> was lying about the whole thing. But, um, Rebel Millie. Rebel Millie. You're one of your favorite versions of uh, Millie. Oh, uh, the two? Yeah, it's, it's up there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, well, uh, what else? That's it, right? I think we covered everything. Great music again. The great who, soundtrack. The Who, you know, always has great music. Judd Apatow was a huge Who fan. And so he wanted to do a big episode of The Who. He said the music was a lot of money to get, as you would expect. But that was before they were just selling out all their, you know, every CSI show has a Who song. And yeah. I mean, 2000 was really just kind of the start of Who Love music again. in, uh, in TV. TV and movies and stuff. But, um, yeah, all right. I, I, I think this is probably, like, in the, in the B-plus range. I think it's slightly better than the last episode. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's completely groundbreaking, but it's certainly a, another very, very good episode. Yeah. Not too many negatives about it. Yeah. I, I don't really think there's any negative, except for the dog part. The dog part was horrible. That was really stupid. That really makes me angry that they couldn't get a picture of a smaller dog. Yeah. You know. That must have been, like, a last-minute decision sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know who checked that box, but... Well, to have a Marmaduke style dog getting run over and you think it's a squirrel. <laughs> That's the logic that was not, not good. There. That was not good logic. That was bad. Bad. Uh, but yeah, I think B plus. B plus sounds one. good. I mean yeah. like I, I, I am tempted to give like um I don't know. Like I really like an Mike Starr's actor. No, not an A. Okay. I feel like A minus is possible, but you're yeah, right. Yeah, Martin Starr did a great job with the I, emotional I, scene. I, I, I can't I, deny I, that. Like his whole thing was really good for me. Um, but I guess I guess you're right in terms of writing, it's it's nothing really groundbreaking. Yeah. So I think I think you I'm can teetering. actually tell a little bit that Paul Feig was not around for the making of this episode. Yeah. You know, um, because he's really the one. I mean, Apatow obviously has, you know, a big part in it too. But Feig really is, you know, executive producing all the episodes. He writes a lot of the stuff. He directs some of the stuff. Uh, these are his, you know, babies. So, yeah, I think you can kind of tell that he was gone. Okay. Yeah, I could see so, that. All right. Well, that's it. We have uh, one more that was never aired originally, and then we'll get to the final three. Uh, Stiller is coming up, second to last episode. Yeah, I thought it was this one, but um, it's got a while yet. We've got a little while, a few Man, more episodes. Making me wait for Stiller. Uh, always. And then uh, now next week we get to see uh, a Daniel episode. Oh. We haven't seen really too many. No. The cheating episode was a Daniel episode. But other than that, not, I mean, he's a side character all the time, 
He's been in every one, except, you know, unlike Ken and Busy Phillips. Yeah. He's been in all the episodes, but he hasn't really gotten... He's, he's had a couple focus, but this one's going to be really sad. This one is Daniel-specific. Okay. At least for the freaks part. Okay. So, uh, that cool. will be next next time, and uh, thank you for joining, Merlin. Welcome. And uh, we'll see you all next time, Freaks and Geeks Friday. Bye.